and if you'll bear with me we'll get started again hopefully this time with audio I am fairly certain we have audio and I'd like to welcome everybody to Pyrograph Live I'm Perry Packer, your host, and I'm here today with Dr. Mark Unverzat, a family practice physician in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I invited him to talk because we have a lot of questions. I say we, being me and everybody I know um, in my family and on social media about uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, and these questions are related to the symptoms and the outcomes and to the impact on the public health system and our hospital system, and also um, questions about best practices for social isolation uh, physical distancing, actually really more, is, is a, I think a more accurate phrase than social distancing. It's kind of nice to stay socially connected while physically distant. Um, but anyway, I was really happy when Dr. Mark agreed to come talk to us. So thank you for being on the show, Dr. Mark. Yeah, sure. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just sharing with our viewers and listeners just a quick bit about your family practice in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, it's a low volume primary care clinic that I've been running since 2006. Awesome. And in full disclosure, transparency, uh, I and my family have been patients of yours for years. And so we, we, we know you and know your practice pretty well. Um, you also run a foundation called Undaunted Carnival Foundation, which um, aims to uh, reduce preventable health issues and social problems in communities around the world. And um, I think I put the link in that in the description on our YouTube page, but um, do you want to just share a word or two about what that organization is all about? Uh, yeah, and actually I started it before I started the practice and brought it into the practice, and my practice is the primary source of income. I allow people to donate to the foundation in lieu of paying me for certain types of, of their medical care, and we've done both international work and work locally, and Currently, with the COVID pandemic crisis, we're working very closely with different organizations here in the Albuquerque area to try and get additional uh, funds out to groups that need it, uh, because obviously there's a ton of need right now. Awesome. Yeah. Um, lots and lots of need. Well, that's actually a good segue to ask about what is the situation right now with the hospitals, and how are we, um, how are we managing the influx of patients? and how successful have we been at flattening the curve so far? Uh, so Albuquerque or statewide? Actually, let's talk about statewide, if you can. Yeah. So the picture in the state is mixed. Um, the northwest corner of the state is our current hotspot, particularly areas uh, along the Navajo Nation. And uh, those areas are, uh, I think the last I read, which was a day or two ago, which surge level three, which is pretty high, uh, meaning that they are transporting uh, some of their sickest patients, both to Albuquerque and to Phoenix. Oh. Um, so the, those are the current hotspots. If you look at a map of New Mexico, the few counties up in the northwest corner are red. Um, other parts of the state are doing much better, and in general, as a state, we've done very well in terms of um, you know what we call flattening the curve, and our um, our um, the trend of the what's called the doubling time of new cases. So you take a defined period of time and see how many new cases are in that defined period of time, and compare that to previous aliquots of time. We're doing very well as a state. Um, and some of the folks that are listening may know about the, what's called the R naught, which is the uh, it's a it's not a fixed variable. It's a um, a measure of the spread of the virus, and uh, it's affected by uh, lots of different things: the biology of the virus itself, seasonality, um, social isolation, social distancing, physical distancing, lots of variables come into play, um, the hmm. uh, strength of your healthcare system, on and on and on. We've done a really good job of lowering that R naught value uh, from over two to closer to one and a half. And if you look at um, things like influenza, the, the goal of diseases like influenza is to keep the R naught at one or below. That's a sort of a stable 
keeps things uh, relatively stable in terms mm-hmm. of not overwhelming the healthcare system, and we're getting very close to that. That's great. I, that's not a term. The R not is something I that's new to me. So I'm going to add that to my list of things to watch. I've been watching the basic numbers, and I actually have a little spreadsheet going. And it's been interesting to watch the spikes, which I see mostly have been coming from McKinley County. And um, I, I've been of, of the assumption that it's related to the outbreak in the Navajo, Navajo Nation. And I've heard a lot of those patients are being brought to Gallup. Um, yeah, and then, like I said, the sicker, they're, they're overwhelmed up there. The Shiprock Hospital, northern, is it northern New Mexico? Anyway, it's the, the big Native American hospital servicing the eastern portion of the Navajo Reservation up in Shiprock is, is pretty overwhelmed. And mm. uh, so they're shipping uh, some of their patients, both, like I said, both to Phoenix and to Alabama. Um, I want to ask a few more questions about some of the distancing and public health in, in a bit, but um, I also want to get to these questions about the symptoms and the outcomes and the you know clinical features of this of this virus. And um, and I also had taken some questions from people on Facebook, and so the the questions I have for you are kind of a combination of those and my own questions. But um, I wanted to start with uh, the a question about people with underlying health conditions. And um, it's pretty well understood that those are the people that really are higher higher risk um, and elderly people as well. But with regard to people with underlying health conditions, is there a sense of which conditions might put you at more risk than others? For instance, somebody with asthma versus somebody with diabetes or, you know, um, is there a sense developing of which ones might be the worst ones um, to be dealing with regards to COVID? Well, I think if you just look at sheer numbers, uh, particularly here in New Mexico, it seems like diabetes is the number one factor uh, of underlying chronic illnesses that predispose you to severe illness and or death. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I think that, I think the key thing to understand with a lot of my answers today is that it's quite astonishing how much we don't know. Um, There is a lot of stuff that's, you know, everybody's throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks, and that's true with media outlets as yes. well. Yes, yes, I've so, noticed. Um, it's just, uh, there's a lot of information, but uh, very little knowledge. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll know more in three or six months once people have had time to really collect and analyze the data and, and um, give us good information. But, mm-hmm. uh you know, the older you are and just the, the sheer number of chronic diseases that you have puts you at greater risk. I mean, yeah. I think that's as specific and as truthful as you can be. And sure. I, I don't think we can say, well, asthma is more dangerous than diabetes. Okay. But if you have asthma, diabetes, heart disease, you know, that's worse than, you know, for the average person than, yeah. you know, someone who has maybe a little hypertension. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things that's been so notable in the you know the reading that I do and following the the developments is that e- even amongst healthy people the range and the variation of symptoms and experience is so wide. Yeah. It seems you know yeah. like people are commenting on how it just seems like there's almost no rhyme or reason to it, which is right. interesting. Right. Yeah, and uh, we, we we just don't understand that very mm-hmm. well at all. Yeah. Um, there, there are a couple of additional questions, and also understood that you know your answers, you know, can only be as de- so detailed at this state of unknowing. But a couple of things: one regarding autoimmune dis- disorders, and um, you know, my daughter has one, as you know, because you're a family doctor. But there's a lot of different autoimmune disorders, and there's um, and I've been reading some uh, material about you know the cytokine storm and this you know this. Um, um, sometimes with autoimmune disorders, there can be a really uh, a way overreaction of the immune system. And is there anything that's being learned about how that is or is not triggered with this virus? Well, I, the short answer to that is yes. The longer answer is we still don't know how to predict who's going to get those types of reactions. Mm-hmm. So you may have read... Uh, about the clotting disorders that you can see. That was the other one I wanted to ask about was clotting because there's a lot of yeah. talk about that and, and strokes in otherwise young, healthy people. 
Yeah. And uh, a good friend of mine who's a family doc in, in the Bronx in New York City has been texting me over the past few weeks about how much of that they are seeing. They're actually seeing people with having to amputate, you know, limbs because yeah. of the clotting. And then on the other hand, you know, unexplained types of bleeding. So that's a subset of patients that their immune response is, um, is you know, it's triggering that arm of the immune response, which, you know, not clearly not everybody is getting. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure I'm saying that clearly, but sure. I think, again, it's just a big part of what we don't know. We see people with gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, one of my ICU colleagues said, you know, I had someone present with the classic symptoms of heart failure. Wow. Um, so what happened was the virus attacked the muscle of the heart primarily. Um, you know, hmm. but, you know, life is a bell-shaped curve, and most of this still is a respiratory disease. And, again, once people get really, really sick, it, it's just such a vicious virus. Different parts of the, of the response system can break down, and depending on what kinds of susceptibilities you have, you may break down in those areas. And so we're seeing some really sick patients with clotting disorders, mm -hmm. other people primarily with respiratory symptoms. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a mysterious and vicious virus. Um, without getting into the weeds too much, I'm curious from the public, from a public health system standpoint, how are doctors such as yourself informed? I mean, can you just give a brief insight into the, communication methods between hospitals, between doctors, from the CDC? I mean, are there, what's the information exchange? How do you, you know, how do the best practices get shared amongst um, so health really, workers? It really depends. Uh, you know, so there are private face group, Facebook groups, uh, Twitter groups, uh, texting, you know, those of us who are in different parts of the country and we know one another through various connections. Uh, in New Mexico, we've been fortunate. We've had really good um, webinars or Zoom-type meetings with our um, state and local experts, and those are happening multiple times during the week. There's also something called Project ECHO here, which is a mm -hmm. telehealth initiative to disseminate information from academic centers out to more needier communities, and they, they're having multiple weekly sessions with different experts so that there's again there's a ton of information um and you know oftentimes i'll tune into these things and the experts are just saying i don't really have anything new to report we're still trying to figure this out so there's some element of that as well you know even the people that are really dealing with this on the front lines from a scientific perspective mm -hmm. are trying to get their heads around it I have one more clinical question before talking a little bit more on the public side, but um, I got a question from somebody on Facebook about um, the approach to uh, use oxygen um, pre preemptively because of the silent hypoxia problem and, um, and perhaps as a way to avoid the need for ventilator use. Is that anything that, that is there knowledge developing about whether that approach might be useful? So the, I mean, oxygen in and of itself does not alter the course of the disease. It just helps treat the symptoms. So it's sort of like, you know, if your arm is broken in two and you put a splint on it, it doesn't help, you know, the bones are going to heal. It just helps heal them straight. Um, and again, oxygen is not going to tell the coronavirus to go away any faster. Yeah. Um, and, they, you know, the issue of sort of silent COVID pneumonia, I think, is, again, it's one of the big unknowns. Right. Um, but, you know, clearly people are describing different scenarios of patients showing up in the emergency room and they're talking and, you know, doing yeah. the normal things and then they measure their oxygen and take a chest x-ray and they go, oh, my gosh. Right. Um, whether that's happening in the general population of people with milder symptoms that are not in an emergency room or a hospital, I don't think we know. Okay. But, uh, again, it's, it's hard to extrapolate one newspaper article or something yeah. that gets circulated around with. You know, again, that was written from the perspective of New York City, where the prevalence 
of um, coronavirus is extremely high. We don't know exactly what it is, but I, you know, the recent information has suggested that a good 20 to 25 percent of the population already has antibodies. So, you know, you take that number and then you funnel that down into the number of people that are in an emergency room, and you can anticipate that well over half or maybe, you know, who knows, but the majority of those patients in an emergency room for whatever reason in New York City are likely to have COVID. That's very different from Albuquerque, New Mexico, or places where the prevalence is much lower. So um, it's just, it's a complicated sort of formula of what are the symptoms, what is the likelihood that I've been exposed to it, and what is the prevalence in my community. Right. What's happening with testing right now in, in our state, a place that you have So more. we've done a, a pretty good job of testing. Uh, testing is much more widely available now. It's, uh, you know, what are, today's the 29th. I mean, just even a month ago, it was virtually impossible to get a test. But now it's relatively easy. Mm-hmm. You know, and in certain situations, it's, it's super easy. It's, it's probably easier than... Gosh, getting a chest X-ray. It's, I mean, it's we've done a good job of disseminating um, uh, tests okay. that don't require going to a medical center and kind of anything like that. And then we're starting to do antibody testing here in New Mexico. There's one for sure. There's one lab that's doing it where you can just pay. I think it's a hundred bucks to get an antibody test. Hmm. And then starting on Monday, our big reference lab is going to start. Um, rolling their test out, which requires a doctor's order. Oh, interesting. Do you think that the level and availability and the plans for rolling out these tests is enough for, so now what our isolation orders are supposedly through May 15th, right? So how do you view our state plan for having enough testing to feel good about working towards that date? Well, that, that's way above my pay grade, yeah. but I'll just tell you um, the summary of the call from was today, Wednesday? Yeah. Uh, I think it was yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. Um, so there's a whole uh, schematic sort of spreadsheet to look at how much testing we need to accomplish, you know, X, Y, and Z goals. And um, you have to start at about 3,000 tests per day. Uh, and getting up to about 5,000 tests per day is considered optimal for New Mexico. I think we're, we're close, but not, not there. Not, certainly not the 5,000, but we're getting close to the 3,000 a day. And, and I'm talking about the, the screening test, not the antibody test. Gotcha. So, this is a test to see if people are actively infected with COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so there are different theories about how much of the population you need to sample to have to have the testing be meaningful. Okay. So again, it gets back to the prevalence of the disease. So if you have an extremely prevalent disease, so a disease that's really common in a defined population, you don't need to test nearly as many people as a disease that's much less prevalent. Right. So if you take uh, the prevalence in uh, sort of the general population in Albuquerque, it's quite low. If you go up to certain parts of the Navajo Nation in New Mexico, it's quite high. So again, all you would need to do is test a certain number of people um, in the lower prevalence and far fewer people in the higher prevalence to create your models that say, well, we think X number of people are infected, and if we maintain good social distancing and the, getting back to this R naught value, mm-hmm. you know, how much is that virus spreading within the community? Then you can create some safe guidelines for relaxation of stay at home orders. I, I don't know if, am I explaining that? So it's a combination, yeah. Yeah. Of, you know. How common is it in your community? And you can do that with a certain amount of testing. Um, and then what are you doing in terms of social distancing? And, um, and what is your healthcare system able to accommodate? So it gets back to that, that variable of, of spread, basically. 
that right. are not. That's all important. And again, that number can go up and down depending on what you do. So if you yeah. say everybody's coming back to school and going back to work, that's going to go up. People are going to get sicker, and then you run the risk of overrunning your healthcare system again. But if you do it smartly and people are following the best practices and good guidelines, particularly with hand washing, um, you know, then there's there's a way to do it safely. Cool. I have a couple questions about those those guidelines. So hand washing, obviously, mask use, stuff like that. I I did get a couple questions from friends on Facebook uh, from two different families that I know wondering about quarantining together. So if you've been quarantined uh, strictly, can a family, uh, you know, feel decent about getting together with another family and and beating so the social you, isolation you, blues that way? Are, are you talking about, when you say quarantine, are you talking about people that have been infected? I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm not using the right, uh, isolating. Isolating, not quarantining, yeah. 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 Um, well, you know, I mean, it's like, uh, it, it's all a calculated risk. So, um, you know, if you have friends and neighbors that you think are a little loosey-goosey on the stay-at-home and, you know, the kind of people that maybe are running to the market to get that yeah. couple of grapefruit that maybe they didn't, you know, I mean, it's, it's all about probabilities. But if... Yeah. if if you're doing what you can to be safe and you're confident that your friends or your family members or your loved ones are, and you follow common sense stuff, hand washing, appropriate distancing, um, and uh, not touching your face, you're probably going to be fine. What about when you go shopping? What should I do with my mask when I come home? What do I do with it? Do I put it in the sun? Do I wipe it down with, with wipes and then go wash my hands? Depends on what kind of mask. I have a cloth mask, like a lot of my friends with with um, artistic, creative uh, folks. I have a nice cloth mask that a friend made. Yeah. So uh, again, all of this is educated. I don't want to say guesses, yeah. but it's it's uh, educated hypotheses. There is some information about using um, dry heat, uh, hydrogen peroxide sprays. Those are things that only healthcare systems can get away with. But um, there are some guidelines that medical providers can continue to reuse their masks as long as they're not touching their face. So again, the mask is, is depending on the type of mask, but the mask is mostly keeping your droplets away from other people. Right. So if you're wearing a mask and you are picking up some bananas and the person next to you is, you know, Breathing, avocados and sprays all you yeah. know sneezes or cuss well that's yeah. then you got to wash it and do it in the hottest water and the highest dryer setting. But if you're going to the store, you barely run into contact with anyone. You, you haven't touched a hundred surfaces and push your mask up and down your face, um, and you know just keep using it. D okay, cool. And for extra measure. Put it out in the strong New Mexico sunlight for yep. 30 minutes, and that'll almost certainly uh, kill most of the, if not all, the COVID virus. Great. That, I've been doing that. I've been leaving it in the sun. I've been wiping it down and leaving it in the sun. Uh, how about wiping down groceries? Do you advise that? Do you do it? Like the outsides of packages and stuff. Produce, I realize, is a little trickier. I'm sorry. I'm, you, I lost you there. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I was asking so about... what I yeah. do is... If, so if I go to the market and, and the, let's say I pick up a jug of milk that's a, sort of a high touch item, mm -hmm. um, then I'm not gonna, you know I'm not going to wash the jug of milk before I drink a glass of milk. Um, I'll tend to wipe that down or just wash it with soap and water before I put it away, and that way I don't have to worry about it. Um, things that I know I'm going to wash before I eat. You know, fruits and vegetables, particularly things that I'm going to cook that's going to be exposed to high heat. I don't worry about that. Cool. Um, packages, uh, typically I'll bring the package in. And, you know, most things you don't really have to open right away. I'll mm -hmm. let it sit for a day or two or three mm -hmm. and then open it and then just make sure I wash my hands afterwards. Okay, great. Um couple other questions. I, there's an interesting question a friend put up about asking who are the people, if this is known, who is getting infected in New Mexico? Is it people like essential workers who are out 
and having to have contact or are are there is it you know not that clean of a break and are there people that have been very careful who are getting sick as well so we don't have really good data on that um, you know for obvious reasons because people have protected health information yeah so and I think I haven't seen anything that's sort of anonymized from the state to give us a sense of what there are some health care workers and essential workers who have definitely gotten sick. Um, I don't, as far as I know, we haven't had any deaths of, of health care workers. Um, the um, uh, people living in, um, in living facilities are extremely high risk. So we've had a nursing home here that's had, gosh, you know, a lot of deaths. Um, and so, again, it gets back to sustained exposure in close living conditions. I, I, I haven't heard of anyone who has absolutely no idea how they got it, gotten gravely ill. Um, it, it may have happened, but, I, again, I think most of the people who become severely ill are the groups that we've been able to identify older, chronic conditions confined environment. There are always going to be outliers. To, I think mm. that's the thing to have be, no matter what we do, even in the most perfect world possible, there's there's always the twenty two year old who has no idea that gets really sick. Yeah. Um, but again I think getting back to the life is a bell curve thing, we I think we do have a pretty good sense of who's affected most significantly by the virus. Uh, my last question is about mental health and what resources you may know of for people to um, turn to in this time when we're all stuck. And, uh, you know, obviously people who already have either mental health, addiction, behavioral health issues, um, it's got to be getting, you know, exacerbated by the situation. And, oh, yeah. um, what is there a public health response on that? You know, with say distance counseling, or what things might be becoming available, or maybe already were available that I just don't know about that people could turn to now. Yeah, well, uh, I mean that's an ongoing challenge, and it's actually something that that the foundation is working with with groups that that we've funded over the years to help increase their capacity, but. Um, you know, again, it's a complicated question because it depends on what the issues really are yeah. um, and what underlying issues they are. If there are substance abuse issues, um, you know, some of the support groups are doing a Zoom-type platform, but, you know, some people don't have the technological access yeah. to do that. I mean, mental health care was already a big struggle, uh, particularly in our communities here in Albuquerque. So... You know, fortunately, a lot of the rules have relaxed in terms of being able to see a counselor, a therapist, a psychiatrist uh, remotely through mm -hmm. even things like FaceTime and Skype. Um, so that helps. But again, all those things are at the margins. And that, that, the capacity of that system is, is really strained. Yeah. So it's, 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 a, it's a huge, huge side effect of the, you know, the whole doing what we can to reduce the spread of the virus. Yes, indeed. And I think all these effects seem like they're going to, you know, persist and have have implications that go on for a while. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, different people have coped differently. Uh, again, I think we're fortunate here in New Mexico where it's really not hard to get outside. Exactly. And, uh, even talking to colleagues, friends, and family around the world, uh, there are some places, Spain and Italy, where I think you couldn't, for a while, you couldn't go more than 100 meters from your home. Or wow. Even going outside was virtually impossible. We don't have those sorts of restrictions. And again, what we've been able to show through our physical distancing measures is that even with people being able to get outside, getting out for essential services, we've still been able to flatten that curve. So that's really encouraging. Um, and uh, yeah, 
Yeah. I mean, getting outside is, a, I think, a big part of it, but that doesn't solve everybody's problems uh, by any means. So it's a huge, true. huge struggle. It's true. Um, so I would encourage people that have a provider, a provider network that they can reach out to that they should, because many of those services have converted to uh, audio slash video uh, platform. Speaking of walking outside, do you recommend people wear a mask, like walking around, you know, taking a walk, say, in their neighborhood streets? Not unless you're going to... No, I don't think that's necessary. No. Um, it didn't seem necessary to me, just my gut feeling, but then I started seeing more people wearing them. And then yeah. I started hearing stories also of... It, this never happened to me, but I've heard many stories of people saying that someone else yelled at them. You know, you should yeah, be wearing a mask. A mask shaming, yeah. Mask shaming, and, and, you know, and I think a lot of that just comes from anxiety, too, just fear. Sure. And sure. so I just started bringing my mask with me because, I mean, it's easy enough for me to, if somebody's upset about it, sure. I'd rather not fight and make everybody's day worse. I like, sure. put the mask on and make it, you know. But it, yeah. but it doesn't feel ne that necessary, all that necessary to me, and it does, it, you're saying that it doesn't seem, it, it, that it's not. Yeah, again, uh, you know, the, the, the knowns are pretty well established by now. It's, it's really, really hard to get this disease through uh, casual contact. You have to be extremely unlucky, you know, to mm -hmm. touch that handle that someone sneezed on that had COVID and then you immediately touch your nose. Um, but if you're walking down the street and your neighbors are across the street from you, you're not, you're not going to spread it, you're not going to get it. Cool. Um, but again, if you're going into more crowded public spaces, if you're going to the market, if you have to go to a doctor's visit, uh, yeah, definitely wear the mask. Yeah, or if you're touring a medical facility with COVID patients, it seems like it would be a smart idea. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah, I didn't see that today. Yeah. Well, I, I again, I really appreciate your time. I don't know if there was anything else that you wanted to add that you, that in your observation is important for the public to know. Well, I mean, it, it's a really tough time, I, it, and it's hard for everybody. Um, the conditions that we're all subjected to are far from normal and are extremely, extremely challenging. But I am hopeful that um, with good guidelines, good guidance, good common sense, uh, and the more that we learn, I, you know, to me, the biggest piece of getting back to some semblance of normal is figuring out for sure what's happening with the asymptomatic spread part. Right. Um, and just as a quick example, what's, what's different from, say, the, the, the SARS from 2003 is that in that, even though it's a very similar virus, people didn't distribute the virus very much unless they had active symptoms. So you could walk into a restaurant, get your temperature taken, and if you didn't have fever or cough or anything, you're almost certainly safe to go in. This disease is different. So mm -hmm. once we figure out that piece and figure out what good public health ways there are to manage that, it just helps relax things for all of us. All these little different pieces of these tools of more widespread testing, antibody testing, maybe potentially some treatments for people who get really sick um, and then of course maybe a vaccine down the road. We keep adding good tools to our toolbox and as long as we have good decision making both on the formal and the informal level and that means governments, health organizations and individuals are you know yeah. decisions individually. It's, it's going to get better. I forgot there's one question I did want to ask I, I just remembered now. It's even on my list. Um, any further word about whether um, people can be reinfected? Um, that was a big one. Uh, and, and what? And and then whatever the answer is to that, what implications that might have for the development of a vaccine? Yeah. So again, we don't know definitively. Mm -hmm. um, the presumption is because many millions of people certainly have had the infection. And most of those people are not continuing to get sick. Uh, the vast, vast majority of those folks are not continuing to get sick. So you have to presume mm -hmm. that just on the basis of that observation, antibodies do confer some immunity. Okay. But what we don't know is 
what antibody level you need to have effective immunity and how long that immunity will last. And so those are, those are open questions. Okay. Um, that again, as we do more widespread antibody testing, you can track people over time. Um, we will know. So we'll have more information to work from. Well, hopefully you can come back, say, in six months. I would imagine six months there will be advances in our knowledge, at, you know, at the rate that we're going. Oh, a lot more. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, um, yes, we certainly will. Yeah. Great. Well, I'd love to have you back, and thanks again for your time. Sure. You're very welcome. Sickness continues, insanity slumbers Don't know if it's true, but you can feel it go under Of the flu and the twitch of the fingers.